Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world. Um, you are literally at the beating heart of RICS today. Uh, we had a dress rehearsal the other day where everything went perfectly, uh, but due to tech reasons, I'm, I'm, I'm plump right in the middle of RICS HQ office today. So you'll see um, various luminaries walking past and I will grab the, um, the CEO or president to, to answer any questions about uh, DCF that might come up to today, but just, um, just be aware there might be a couple of noise distractions and, and apologies for that in advance. Um, but never mind all that, we've got a fantastic panel session with you today, and uh, I'm gonna shortly introduce the DCF consultation, and then fantastically as well, we have the lead author with us, Neil Crosby, who's gonna set out the practice information findings. Um, my brilliant colleagues, Hashim Kadem and Peter Sedell also, who worked on the, uh, the global uh, expert working group for the discounted cash flow um, practice which has just uh, recently launched along with the DCF hub and some of the other material we're talking about. So I'm really hoping we've got the right people in the in the virtual room um, today to help us. If we haven't, I'll, I'll grab some more people from behind us today. <laughs> um, uh, just to say also that, that uh, Peter is, is dialing in today again. Uh, the dress rehearsal was perfect, but, but a, a couple of tech issues there as well. So you, you won't see Peter's face, but unfortunately you'll probably see um, quite a lot of my face. Uh, and talking of which, let's let's get away from um, me for a moment uh, and introduce our very esteemed panel, uh, starting with uh, Professor Neil Crosby, please. Yeah, I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Reading, which is basically a very posh title for being retired now. Um, but I, w I was asked by the RICS to lead author the the guidance note, which is now a pra let me get the right thing, practice information. Um, and um, I had a lot of help from a lot of people in doing that. So I'm taking most of the responsibility, but not quite all of it, as you'll see from some of the questions, I suspect. And uh, Hashim, please. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, Hashim Kotham, uh, Director at Savills um, in our Middle East business, uh, primarily focusing on valuation and yeah, we've been helping uh, Charles and Neil uh, with a regional uh, perspective. Thank you, Hashim. And to Peter, please, on the phone. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Peter Sudell. I've been at BNP Paribas real estate for almost 38 years now, um, basically doing commercial investment valuations. But um, again, on the working group with Neil, I'm trying to put the um, practitioner's perspective across sometimes when the academic one well, I might not agree with all the time, so I'm looking forward to the rest of today. Um, but before we get into the uh, the panel discussion fully, I did just want to set out uh, what, what what we proposed during the consultation, what we found from the consultation um, results, uh, and give you a bit of um, detail around that. Um, Sakine, if you could just help me uh, move forward with with the slides. Uh, but before we did that, when we um. When we undertook a version of this webinar back in March, I think it was, of this year, we um, took some polling of the audience to try and make it a little bit interactive. Um, so we took some polls of the audience and we thought that we would um, uh, try and repeat that exercise today and see where, where we are in terms of uh, DCF application uh, globally and, and with the audience that we have on, on, online today. So. Uh, if, if you are able to uh, interact with this poll, it would be great. I think Sakine's going to give us about 30 to 40 seconds uh, to answer the question. So uh, to answer the opening question, if you could, of to what extent do you use DCF in your valuations to calculate market value? Just just a quick steer on, on where we are in terms of DCF application. And I do underline the market value part because in some ways that was the unique aspect of the practice information that we've published. Have we have we got votes coming in, Sakine? Hi, Charles. Yes, we have. I think Fantastic. we have some issues, but I can tell you the results. Mm. Okay, if we could publish those now. Yeah. So um, attendees can see the the um, the results, and when I say technical issues, is that a hundred percent said regularly, which I don't think this is um, all all the people who answered, but we have they have uh, answered in the question box and some of them said rarely 
and I, some of them said, yeah, so regularly and rarely me. Well, in, in, in some ways, that would, that would be a fantastic result. But given that when we did the poll in March, it was 65% said rarely, um, it, it's either a different audience or something's gone wrong there. So maybe continued our, our, our tech gremlins uh, of today. But Sakine, if you could go to the start of my presentation now, rather than the middle of it, that, 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 would, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to introduce to you basically the practice information uh, uh, and the consultation today. Neil's going to go into a bit more detail about what he found in authoring the practice information, but I wanted to introduce the wider program of work that RSES is doing on DCF. So if you go to the next slide, and, and again, please. So uh, RSES um, has been developing DCF work streams for some time now. That's due to insight that's come from the market, uh, from stakeholders, from valuers, uh, clients, investors. It also came as an outcome of the valuation review, of course, and some of the recommendations um, within that as well. And just in a way that we are, we're very agile, we constantly update our standards and guidance and supporting information that goes along with it. And we realized that the, the only guidance we really had was, a, was the old um, UK guidance note covering DCF. And we just realized that actually we need to bolster some of our DCF content and make sure it's up to date. And what we did was, um, in some ways, we looked at not just doing that through a single standard or through uh, just updating the global red book. Um, in addition to updating our professional standards, we looked at other avenues to really get across the message of, um, of wider DCF application in, in a, on an appropriate basis in the market. And what we found was um, we proposed a DCF hub, a web-based page which had lots of relevant content to do with DCF on it, uh, launching an upskilling program as well. So that's training courses, web classes, webinars such as today. So not just having a, a standard on the page, but also bringing uh, that standard and practice information to life um, through supporting material as well. And of course, as Neil will come on to talk about in a little bit more detail, the practice information that was launched last week. I did just want to mention as well that if you're, if you're um, Dialing in from the UK today, dialing in, that's probably not the right term, logging in, <laughs> that, that, that's better. You, you probably also noticed that we consulted on a specific UK standard um, for investment property in the UK. And one of the consultation results is that we haven't actually moved forward with that standard, but we are going to look at what we need to do globally moving forward. So just to point out that um, the UK standard that was, that was consulted on, uh, further to your fantastic feedback, we haven't taken that forward at this time. Um, if you did want to look at the consultation, it has been closed um, for some time now, but all of the material is still uh, available online should you wish to go and look at that. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to say that, yes, the, the DCF hub went live on the 9th of uh, November. Um, it's the starting place for that. Uh, for that page. We're going to constantly update it moving forward, making sure that it's got relevant content for all of our users. Um, just as a basic at the moment, it has the practice information, it has the basis for conclusions, so how we got there. It has some frequently asked questions that we get asked a lot, and I'll go through some of those on the call today as well. Um, and, but it's also got some other relevant material from our economics team, from our data and technology team as well, as links to our insight community and, and other relevant conversations that are going on around DCF, our property journals and the like. So what we're hoping as in terms of RSES members, RSES stakeholders, if you want a one-stop shop for discounted cash flow valuation um, application, whatever the purpose or market you're using it for globally, hopefully that's the place now on the RSCS website where that information is clearly there and available for you to freely access. And next slide, please. So I did want to just talk about some of the insight we've gathered from the, uh, from the consultation, but I did want to start off just with some myth busting, uh, first of all, because there's probably three or four questions that I've got asked literally hundreds of times via LinkedIn, on the Insight community, by email, that, and the main one, by far the main one, is, is RSCS mandating the use of DCF? People, of course, have read the valuation um, review content, its recommendations, they've read um, press content, uh, further details that have been put out by RSCS and some of the people who are in the wider market conversation around use of DCF. 
we're seeing in many markets an increasingly prevalent use of DCF, depending on the valuation purpose, the type of asset, the jurisdiction. But what we're not doing uh, at RSCS is mandating the use of DCF, uh, using it more frequently in appropriate circumstances, using growth explicit models where appropriate as well. But ultimately, the choice of the valuation method is is the valuers and that and that's embedded into into global red book in terms of the uh, approaches methods and models content but also the reporting standards as well the choice of valuation approach and method is ultimately with the valuer and it is per their judgment and that's not changing as per the standards we've been brought out so it's more about supporting and encouraging the appropriate use of dcf rather than mandating it through through a standard um, a suggestion, RSCS somehow suggesting explicit DCF models are better than implicit income capitalization models. And, and it's not whether one's worse or better, it's what's suited to the task it is what's really come out through um, the consultation and discussion that we've had to the, to the market, uh, um, to the asset that, that's being valued. Of course, judgment is required in that. And Neil, I expect, will come on to talk about that the basis of value is also an important factor in terms of whether you're looking at market value uh, or, or investment value calculations of worth. Uh, and indeed, uh, the practice information covers both of those bases in detail. Um, does RSCS require the use of one method? There was there was quite a lot of confusion in terms of some of the commentary around DCF that somehow it was only ever using one method. And valuers are free to use multiple methods. Um, the Global Red Book and uh, related standards ask that the valuer comes to one conclusion and evidence that conclusion. But, but ultimately, there may be circumstances where multiple methods may be used, and that may be advantageous to do so. So again, just some myth busting that, that, that uh, RSS is in some way promoting a, a single method. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, just moving on to the next slide, please, again. And just uh, some of the consultation response highlights, um, hundreds and hundreds of pages of comments that, that um, Neil went through every single uh, one of them, as did the working group in supporting them, um, looked at them, analysed mm -hmm. them. Many of them were on similar themes, and I just wanted to go through some of those themes today. We've updated the practice information in relation to many of those comments. We've looked at the way we're doing the hub. We're look, looking at the way we're delivering the global red book standards moving forward. And of course, we've made the decision about the UK standard as well, all based on your fantastic consultation feedback, which was very detailed. It didn't just come from valuers. It came from uh, the users of valuations, investors, clients, lenders, um, all stakeholders in in the market, and it was great to have that um, to have that detailed response. And we thank you uh, as attendees and as consultation respondents to, to being part of the conversation on DCF. Uh, I've mentioned that in general, one of the main focuses was around the autonomy of the valuer and, and decisions being appropriate to the asset being valued. That was almost the overriding um, theme. There was a suggestion in that. We're doing a DCF webinar, we're doing a, a DCF practice information, support hub standards, a perceived bias that RSCS was suggesting, therefore, that, that in some cases a, a certain valuation is appropriate more than others. And it's not that, it's just more the other way around, that RSCS is reflecting the market conversations that are going on around more analytical and growth explicit types of valuations being used. So it's not that we're biased towards our uh, DCF, it's that we're taking on the feedback around needing greater coverage um, of it. Um, the ultimate goal of the valuation review was to improve valuation transparency, quality and understanding for users of valuations and it's that overarching goal that we've tried to thread through this uh, updated content on the DCF method. method. Um, there was general support for the place for uh, principles-based overriding valuation standards was global red book, not necessarily within the jurisdictional UK standard that, that, that I mentioned, but actually it should be at a global level. It is quite surprising for people, and and I recommend it as a as a as an additional CPD exercise to to this um, webinar itself is to go back and look at the Global Red Book VPS five content on approaches, methods, and models because it is surprisingly slim in many cases, just a couple of pages on approaches, methods, and models. So there are some decisions moving forward around um, what that content might include and amendments that that we make to it. Um, but a general sort of um, 
discussion is how, it, how, is how it is about how prescriptive ultimately that content should be. Global Red Book has always been a, a principles-based um, document as opposed to a prescriptive set of rules, but there are some suggestions certainly in consultation responses around uh, circumstances where RSCS could go further in supporting um, choices, but of course the, uh, the flip side of that is the value autonomy arguments that have been made. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've published the DCF Hub and it was broadly supported by people raising awareness of, of all of these issues related to DCF. There were some consultation responses that RSCS and others should have more of a role in data provision and um, the inputs and parameters around uh, a discounted cash flow. That's not usually the role uh, of RSCS within valuation. We're usually the standard setter, we set the principles, but we don't provide the inputs to the valuation. Um, but there was a suggestion from some about where might be the right place where people could get additional support around uh, parameters and certainly around the data that might be included in their valuations moving forward. And that's a conversation that we'll continue to have and continue to update that, the, the hub mm -hmm. accordingly around that. And the other thing that we consulted on was around upskilling, of which this webinar um, forms part. We also have a program of web classes coming up, um, podcasts, the hub itself, journal content. So this isn't just a, a single we, we're a webinar and then done. This is an ongoing program of support for valuers around the use of discounted cash flow and as per the consultation responses, around all um, valuation uh, approaches, methods and models that might be supportive from the market as well. Uh, next slide, please, Sikim. Um, Neil's going to go into detail around what a practice information, uh, what, what his findings were as the lead author of that, and I won't um, talk about that in too much detail, but it, as Neil inferred at the top of the call, RSES has changed its standards classifications uh, in order to simplify them and just mean that there's either a professional standard or a practice information. And in very crude terms, what that means is a professional standard is something that contains musts and shoulds, recommendations and requirements on, on valuers. It might cover, for example, ethical issues or, or mandatory content for valuers. And then practice information is more um, supporting material, data, toolkits, processes and definitions that, that, that help support the valuer in doing their job. But crucially, a practice information, that, uh, I, I've mentioned this already, does not contain any mandatory content and doesn't set requirements for RSES members. So in some ways, reassurance that the practice information coming out isn't going to set mandatory requirements on valuers, but that's not to say that um, there isn't very, very important uh, information included in that practice information and it's supporting content. And of course, valuers need to move with the markets, they need to move with the times, they need to move with uh, 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 other professions, legislation, recommendations globally. So uh, valuers need to uh, move forward in terms of their application of valuation methods. Uh, and this is where the practice information will help support, we hope. Uh, next slide, please, again. I, I, I promised uh, everyone on the rehearsal that I wouldn't go through too much detail of Red Book, but we can't do a RSES standards and practice information presentation without having at least one uh, a healthy Red Book quote within there. So just getting back to that uh, VPS5 content around it ultimately being the valuer's responsibility for necessarily justifying the, the valuation approaches and the methods that they use but also to make them relevant to the, to the market in which they're operating in uh, and the practices and processes within that market. It, unless expressly required by statute or other mandatory requirements within their market, no one valuation approach or single valuation method necessarily takes precedent over another one. But that's not to say there aren't um, best practice and good practice decisions that a, that a valuer can make around the choice of approach and method suitable for the market in which they're operating in. Uh, I've only concluded the VPS 5 quote there. There is, of course, a VPS 3 reporting requirement um, uh, around valuation uh, uh, approach and method as well, um, just to underline that. Uh, next slide, please. RSCS aren't the only provider of information within the Global Red Book covering discounted cash flow content. We, of course, have the international valuation standards, which are fully incorporated into Global Red Book. And just drawing attention to, as many of you will know, IVS have 
themselves consulted on their exposure draft earlier in 2023. I believe from their latest um, AGM, I understand they're looking to publish in January 2024. Um, there is a lot more discounted cash flow content within the international valuation standards than there is within the global red book. Um, and they are, uh, IVS have fundamentally changed the structure of the standards for 2023. Uh, and I would recommend looking through the IVS content. Indeed, Neil helpfully references it throughout the practice information. And of course, it's consolidated within Global Red Book as well. But as part of this conversation of developing global standards moving forward, I'd be aware of what's going on with IVS, which will, of course, then inform what happens with Global Red Book into our 2024 uh, update. And something else that's worth pointing out as well is um, something that always got me as a valuer joining RSES and reading the latest IVS, and I, I see it in conversations with others as well, is, is of course the references to approach, method and model, which um, I'm guilty myself, we, we as valuers can tend to um, use interchangeably, but means slightly different things within uh, the international valuation standards and therefore global red book. So where we're referring to, to approaches, method and models, just being careful around that moving forward as well. And uh, next slide. Well, I think you'll all be pleased to know that's it for me in terms of the uh, in terms of the consultation introduction. And now it's over to Neil to, to give us uh, a run through of what he found from authoring the practice information. Right. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. I've tried to share it, so uh, and I've got control of it, which makes it easier for me. So, um, as, as I said at the beginning, I was I was asked by the RICS to take on the task of lead author, <clears throat> which I think for this is 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 was was a difficult task because you're trying to reconcile so many different views. Um, what I what I tried to do was look at the some of the a lot of the um discussions during the valuation review there's no question that we need a new dca i, I get i kept being told off for calling it a guidance note so i've actually done it on this slide as well um because of the, that's how i saw it as with in the old money of the rics where we had um professional statements but we had guidance notes to add the uh, technical detail because for me the, the the red book has always been a process handbook and not a methods and i know the ivs have a lot more methods in their uh standards than the rics and i, I think it's it's good to keep principles in one document and then look for guidance on technical on, on another that isn't mandatory and and that's how, how this has been written and of course that's how the practice information as, as charles had just said has now been set up the last one was 13 years ago it was very uk centric and so it needed a, a global perspective as well as updating and we cannot ignore the um peter pierre gray uh, valuation review and the rics accepted all those recommendations that peter made and a number of them related to actual valuations and using explicit cash flows and one of them did create a hell of a stir within the consultation and I'll get, I'll get back to that one and I suspect you all know which one it was. So it reignited the debate, um, something that I mean I'm, I'm now in my 70s and I started when in 1971 in this industry just about the time that people started to talk about cash flow methods instead of the old methods, the traditional methods. We had some issues about what we're going to call things and we ended up calling the what i would call the traditional capitalization rate methods uh, implicit methods and the, the explicit cash flow methods we called it exactly that explicit dcf um, and tried to use that terminology all the way through there were some very strong views on both sides in in the um in the review and on in the consultation as well about the use of traditional and the um, consultation and the review also brought up some misunderstandings and, and I think the main one was the role of the valuation and so 
part of the the um, work that we did on the practice information was to expand the conceptual part of this, which is we've got chapters in in it, uh, which I'll, I'll allude to in a minute, um, on difference between market value and investment value. Some consultation and review comment said basically an investment value is the value of an investment and it certainly is not it is a completely freestanding definition a definition which personally i think is now wrong um it used to be the basically a calculation of worth to either the market or to an individual and ibs has changed it to to uh, worth to the individual and i think that was a, a retrograde step because i do think there are issues around exchange price, market value, and what we should be paying, and that's investment value, and that has market as well as individual investor differences. So I'll allude to that a little bit more later as well. Um, and there was also the one that really made me extremely worried, and that was quite a few clients in the review discussions that I took part in and in the consultation talked about how moving to DCF would get us now to the right answers as opposed to the wrong answers. In other words, it would change the answers, implying somehow that all the market valuations done by valuers using implicit techniques were wrong. And, and I think that one we have hopefully killed at, at birth in this um, in this. Uh, practice information. So the co turning to the content, um, because of the in interesting differences of opinions, let's put it that way, between uh, what happened in, in both the review and later in the consultation on the actual draft, um, that we put a lot more into this guidance note about the context contextual information about uh, valuations, how you undertake them. Um, and about what are the precise differences between an investment value definition and a market value definition. We've addressed the issue of choice of method and we are unequivocal that it lies in the hands of the value. It always has and always should do. The choice of method isn't specified in Red Book in any way and is about the individual circumstances of the individual case. And we put a lot into the guidance note about that choice, about which method or which methods. And obviously the one that Charles alluded to absolutely is that you can apply a method or a number of methods to get to your, your uh, opinion of value. And I think that is, that is clearly the case in, and has been in the past. The one thing that we have tried to um, communicate more clearly than in previous uh, documents, in the previous guides of note, is that all valuations of investments are really a DCF in one form or another. In one form or another, I should say. <clears throat> so we've tried to discuss the similarities as well as the differences between those two models and how they can be simply reconciled. In the original draft we had about three appendices full of worked examples about how you can um, what the differences are and how you can reconcile them i think the um the the uh, let's just say that two of those three appendices were were told and appendix one now does have some examples but they are much reduced and that obviously uh, is uh, Charles has already referred to the hub and how we might be developing more worked examples in the future um, but the the danger is that a worked example becomes a template for every valuation and you cannot have that as 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 and the other thing we got from the consultation is quite a few people in the consultation said can you just give us a number can, can, can we have details of what numbers we should plug into a DCF, which is equally impossible as far as I'm concerned. You know, it all depends on the individual cases, so I'll get to that in a bit as well. As well. Okay. So what did we do? Well, we, we put two chapters in, one on market value and one on investment value on the identification of the inputs to each of those um, different 
you know, types of valuation. And that's how, so we structured the, I think it's five chapters altogether. Well, I know it's five chapters altogether. It's introduction. We've got a, a, a reconciliation of um, explicit DCF and implicit, and I've called it traditional on this slide wrongly, so you can see where my uh, biases are coming from. Or having having spent sort of 30 or 40 years calling them traditional valuations, it's quite difficult to go to implicit suddenly. Um, but that's what that's what we're talking about here. We've done a chapter on the context um, for applying DCF methods, and it does talk about um, where it might be appropriate to use a, an implicit approach and what, where it might be appropriate to use explicit, where it's appropriate, and the, the amount of sophistication within the DCF methods, which I think is also important. And then we've done the two chapters on um, DCF for market value. And in that chapter, we've got quite a lot of uh, detail about market-driven inputs and those inputs, a lot of them are market driven, whether you're doing an investment value to the individual or to the market, or you're doing a market value. They are the same. They should not be the opinion of the, the um, individual when they can be identified from the market. And we've done quite a little bit on, on that. Um, <clears throat> I did have a conclusion in the original which was a set of recommendations, but you saw from Charles that that's uh, not uh, not what the practice information is supposed to be about. So that was cold, uh, which uh, I was quite sorry about because I thought we could sort of set some kind of tone about when to do things and when not to do things um, as far as it, the different valuation models are concerned or methods, I should say, are concerned. So, as I said, we've got three appendices, implicit versus DCF valuation, and how you can perhaps reconcile, and that gets us each of them, and that gets us to the justification issue, which is um, you, you should, according to the Red Book, justify your, your choice of valuation method. And I think that there was uh, an element in the... Uh, uh, Peter Pierre Gray um, recommendations that got up the nose of quite a few established values, and that was the one about DCF should become the principal method. Now we have rode back on that to an extent in that the method is the choice of the valuer in the hands of the valuer, and they should choose the appropriate method or methods, and and but they have to justify the choice of method. And one way of justifying the use of a capitalizer, a comparison method for exchange price, which seems totally reasonable to me, um, you know, the best evidence of exchange price in the marketplace is what other similar assets are being uh, transferred for. So it's quite right that the market value is driven by that information because it is a single point in time exchange price and it doesn't give you any information about whether it's the right price, but it is the price that you can get in the market at that particular point in time. But it is easy to put any valuation using a cap rate into a DCF framework. And so we have put a technical appendix in there about how you might be able to do that. And I suspect that's the one that will be the uh, one that's um, discussed more than any other part of the of the guidance now, of the sorry practice information we put a bit in about risk analysis because that was in the peter Pereira gray um recommendations and we have got a, an appendix on depreciation obsolescence which i think is an important part of dcf valuations and that and although a lot of dcf is covered in major textbooks that bit has been perhaps less well covered. So that's the reason for that being in there. So I think I'll stop there. That there are, I've, I've put more on the slides that no doubt will be shared with you um, after, the, after the webinar um, on some of those sort of more technical points. But I think if we stop there, it gives us plenty of time to pick those out in the questions. Um, there are questions about data. And where are we going to source the data from? And I do have some views on that, but probably leave that for the questions. 
Um, and so I'll I'll hand it now back to the the uh, to Charles. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. And hopefully I get the opportunity to uh, get back to our other panelists now and and just go through um, some questions as well. And I wanted to put the the first question to Hashem, uh, and that was. Um, we received lots of consultation feedback about multiple methods, cross-checking, and ultimately the relationship between uh, the implicit capitalization method, so-called traditional method, and explicit DCF. And um, we had conversations with people about how they were using their software to run two methods, uh, how multiple methods might be used in practice as well. I just wanted to uh, hear from a practitioner about how you'd go about that uh, and how multiple methods uh, are used in practice or not. Uh, thanks, Charles. Ultimately, as you know, Neil has said, um, this paper gives uh, you know, more information, more clarity on what we would expect to see uh, in a DCF, um, and how we do it in the region here, where maybe some incorrect methods are being used, um, or maybe not so appropriate methods. Probably a better way of putting it um, is to now introduce this with clients that a cross-check can be done, um, and especially where you're trying to replicate what's being done on the buy side um, or the sell side, depending on where you're, you know, which um, angle you're working at it. Um, and so it's really digging into the assumptions that are available in the market um, to come up with the market value that these assets are being transacted at. Thank you. And I wanted to um, also ask, and, I, and I'll go to, to Peter this time as well, that I mentioned that we haven't taken forward the UK standard that we consulted on in terms of uh, uh, applying DCF mandatorily to, to um, investment property, or at least the consideration of it. But in terms of our global outlook, now I'm looking, looking forward in Global Red Book and how we incorporate IVS, appreciating we don't know what the final IVS will be yet, but um, do you see a place within the global um, standards for some additional coverage of, if not DCFs explicitly, then, then valuation methods? Um, I think going back to what I think you may you, either you or, or Neil said earlier, um, the Red Book isn't about, it's about process, it's a process guide. Um, and it's always been left down to us as individual values to find the right value by the right method. And um, I think one of the challenges with the Peter Pereira Green um, desire that it should be managed to use DCF was that where do you draw the line? Um, what you can't use it for your, uh, we, we always use the fish and chip shop in Wigan as, as an example. You wouldn't use it for a fish and, shopping, fish and chip shop in Wigan. It's not appropriate, but it may be appropriate for a complex shopping center to use a DCF but that you cannot draw an arbitrary line saying this is where you use a DCF and this is where you don't. Um, and therefore, that again, as we said, has to be the valuer's, um, valuer's judgment. Um, and what we're doing here, just to go back to the first question, what, what I'm seeing is actually people are using traditional methods and more and more are doing a, a, a DCF behind that because as a valuer, we do not have the knowledge of what the right discount rate is. Um, we're not experienced in putting a growth rate in, and there's quite a bit of debate. I'm sure we'll come to that in the growth rates later, but I won't come onto it now. But as a practitioner, I have to, I'm learning about how to apply a DCF day to day. But there is one mantra we always use, which is you have to value as you analyze. And if we're going to use DCF regularly as, as a prime route of valuation, we have to do a lot more analysis of deals and transactions on a DCF basis to understand what the drivers are to that valuation. So back to you. Can I, can I just break in? They, one of the, th uh, th there is uh, Sweden uh, use DCF as their as their main approach. It's a very simplistic form of DCF, I have to say. But what, of course, they now do is that in their equivalent of MSCI or what used to be IPD, uh, they actually now uh, are they record both the growth rate and the discount rate and it's part of the output of MSCI so when we talk about data I think the, the, for me I do see that if we start analyzing 
the, the even if we use a, a straightforward direct comparison of capitalization rate, we should be starting to analyze that in, in terms of what sort of growth and discount rate it is. Now, you can do that in a very simplistic form or much more complicated form, but I do think that that data should start to be collected just like we collect cap rate data and rental growth data as, as standard now. I mean, that's been going on for 20, 30, probably 40 years. Um, I, I can see in the future that we will collect as standard discount rates and growth rates. Now, they are, in, in a sense, from, from a single cap rate, um, you, you can only fix one of them. In other words, the, the, the other one, that you know, you've got to assume one to get the other. So I do think there is, you know, there's, there's a discussion to be had about the technicalities of that. Um, and, and I mean, Peter mentioned forecast, and I'm going I'm to jump sideways. Peter mentioned forecasting. Um, the record on forecasting in the past has not been great, is all I'm going to say at the moment. And so uh, we all think about DCF as being uh, more explicit, more transparent. But it is a forecasted model, um, and so I think we need to be much more honest about just how good we are at forecasting, uh, because it is a mainstay of that kind of model. Charles, sorry, do you mind if I just add one note to that um, on yeah, what Peter and Neil have said? I think this is why everybody in this group are so passionate about this, yeah. because it's so timely. Um, in terms of where the world is on a macro level uh, with data. And I think as a profession, you know, we need to be ahead of that conversation, which you touched on, Charles. I think that, that's crucial. And I think um, Rami, uh, who, who has asked us a question um, as, a, as a, an audience member, which I think um, gets to some of this as well. And they talk about um, where governments might um, publish discount rates. You might get discount rates from market sources as well. Um, there might be published discount rates or, or at least uh, they might be shared in other contexts as well, I guess similar to, to the way that the yield evidence might be shared in some markets now. But how, how should that evidence be applied or whether it should be applied? Um, presumably there should be some caution if it doesn't relate to the individual circumstances of, of the valuation, but ultimately where are we going to get the information from? I don't know, I'll go to Neil on that, given you raised the point about if there is um, discount rates from published sources, Neil, to what extent can they be applied in the valuation? Well, I think the the real problem with commercial real estate is that the data sets are not in the public domain. Mm. They're in private hands almost universally, and um, you know, uh, and and I think that is a major issue. And I do not think that governments are particularly interested in uh, providing that data to us, or and how are they going to do it anyway if they if they haven't got the cooperation of the industry? So, you know, we've had, I mean, look how successful IPD were when they thought up the, the, model, the performance measurement model and collecting all that data. And, you know, at the time, I, mean, I, can, I can remember when they were first starting and the difficulties they had in persuading uh, people to put all their data into one place. Um, but obviously, um, it's very confidential or very expensive, whichever which way around you put it. Um, we're having another debate on valuation at the moment about a thing called prudent value, which is a sort of long-term value, and that is extremely data-driven, and that debate's going on across the whole of Europe, and in some places like the UK, we do have the data to do that, quite, sophist you know, quite sophisticated data to be able to do that type of role. But in Eastern Europe, for example, the data sets are... Um, in the hands of the firms and are probably not very long lasting anyway. You know, they haven't been collecting them for that long and not in any, um, uh, what's the word, sort of man, you know, uh, manner that is sort of consistent across across the markets and what have you. So that, that's becoming an absolute major, major issue. Not becoming, it has been for 30 or 40 years and it still is for me, the major issue about where do we get all the stuff from to underpin all the things that we could do if we have the data. During the, no, uh, the, 
Please, Peter. So I, was, I think it's an interesting question here because going to DCF, and you're asking for actually where we can have published discount rates. Um, well, we've had Transvaal for years in the UK, and apologies for those who are outside the UK, um, and equivalent yields. And we have some data on that, but I, there's no consensus data of what equivalent yield should be. Uh, yes, major firms publish yield sheets, which are very useful, but they are very opinion driven and probably vary quite a lot from what the MSCI index is reporting. Um, and they offer prime property generally. Um, but going to DCF and going to a discount rate on the DCF, at least the equivalent yield is just a single figure. And because it's implicit growth and return, um, you can have a single figure. You can't publish a discount rate without knowing what the growth assumptions are. And so it just gets more complicated under DCF. Yeah, but Sweden do it. Now, what we don't do know is, is how, how useful it is and how much it's um, used. And it, it do, may, do, of course, do the... Hmm, sorry, go on. So I was going to say, Sweden, I know, published their discount rates. I didn't think they, they the growth rates were included in that. Oh, OK. But I may be wrong. So, so no, you may not be, actually. Yeah. I may be making the assumption here. I knew they did the, the discount rates, but I, I, I always made the same assumption that you did, is that they can't do that without the other. They can't do one without the other. So they are reporting the discount rate as one of their outputs, and they are the only country in the world, I think, who MSCI actually gets discount rates from. I think that's right. But, um, but the growth rate bit is, is a very it's it's a very difficult figure to put in because it, it changes over time. I wanted to address a few questions that have been raised in the audience, and I'm, I'm going to consolidate some of those into one question, really. But it's people have been using. Um, so-called tradition uh, income capitalization methods in their markets for some time. They're comfortable with them, they're happy with them, and in their minds they can put in explicit assumptions such as void periods in, into those calculations. So what can a DCF do that a, a, a income capitalization, simple income capitalization, implicit income capitalization model can't do ultimately what 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 is the the, the sell for dcf in terms of its dynamic advantages and i'll go to peter on that first now i, I think this is, this is part of the crux of the whole argument and i think using the word implicit for one and explicit for the other i think has problems in itself because the implicit and explicit nature is really about growth but even Tradval, and i think this is one thing where the profession has has basically lagged quite badly over the last 20, 30 years I've been around, is that we are not more explicit in terms of void costs, capex, um, et cetera, and even renewal probabilities. And that's a new thing. I'm not meaning you're going to go there. But we tend to assume that it, our income stream is just income. Um, and we don't build enough voids or enough voids in. And I think there is a long way to go which we can harmonize the two approaches, the Tradval and the um, the DCF approach, if we were to be far, far more explicit in our in our costs and be consistent in how we actually approach voids. Now, I know from my experience talking to other practitioners in the market that we all have different ideas when we should bring in exit voids. Some people, we tend to bring them in from day one. Um, so I always have them at the end there. And in 10 years, 15 years out, they might not be that relevant. Some people bring them in at five years. Some people bring them in at three years. Um, do we always reflect net effective rents um, on rent reviews? You're never going to get 100% on the office rent review nowadays. So do people actually reflect net effective rents in there? And there's a lot of work we can do as an industry on our Tradval, being more explicit in our Tradval approach, which actually will lead us to a very, very small gap till we get to a DCF. Because as Neil said earlier, a Tradval is a DCF. It's just wrapped up in a different way. Um, 10 YP is on 10 percent is 10 yp because it's a dcf that's what that's what the calculation is behind it and i think we often forget that so i think there's a lot more we can do in Tradvale to bridge this gap because we're not going to jump to dcf in one day if we're going to get better at dcf we've got to get better at Tradvale first yeah we we do make that point in the practice information that the you know the term implicit and explicit is is, is a, 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 the difference is a lot more subtle than one is completely implicit and one is completely explicit. Uh, yeah. You can have va variations across the theme, but the the, the 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 common denominator is that a cap rate 
is the, in a sense, the discount rate, assuming no change in income apart from renewals, voids, et cetera. You can put those in or you can't. The, the, the target rate of return is not that. And, and I, you know, I can remember the times when uh, cap rates were 5%, but uh, target rates return were 13, 14, 15%. That made a difference. You know, the, the implied uh, sort of growth rates within, within those type of calculations were eye-watering. And, you know, anybody who was working off in the 1980s, late 1980s, were working off implied growth rates of 8, 9%, constant through the 90 into the 1990s and we all know what happened so it's about transparency it's not that the five percent is wrong it's that um it's can you inform both all, all the stakeholders in this what the actual cat rate really means and i think extracting it into a more explicit DCF does do that transparency job. It shouldn't change the answers. You know, in exchange in, in for market value, if if that's what you can get for it, that's what you should be reporting. If the client wants to know more than that, then they're not actually asking for a market value. Market value can only tell you that because it is an exchange price. Unless you're in perhaps Germany or Austria, Switzerland, where they they tend to take a little bit of the um well is that a, is that a defensible number into account and i think that's a, a polite way of putting it in other words they smooth it a bit but the definition of market value is is exchange price and so it's the best method to get to that answer if you have comparable information and you have in a sense simple cash flows sim, sim, quite simple cash flows then what's wrong with that as the main method and then you can uh, unpack the answer into a more explicit DCF. All those things are possible and I think should be recommended, but the recommendations would take me out. So it's not recommended, <laughs> it's just possible now. You've already said that once more. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens with the Global Red yeah, Book moving forward. <laughs> um, we've got a few questions from people who are relatively earlier in their valuation career. They might be uh, ABC candidates, they might be students, and in some cases they're operating in markets where DCF isn't being frequently used. And a few people have asked about the relevance of, of the method and whether they should learn about the DCF method. Uh, I'll go to Hashem first and, and ask, um, do, you, do you see it being a relevant method for people early in their career to use? You could see it um, being, its use being expanded moving forward? Uh, it's obviously relevant on wherever they're practicing um in terms of you know going forward with their careers i personally believe that it will be because i think we're becoming more closely aligned with other professions um where a lot of the you know valuations stem from um in terms of apc students if they can't practice in their market there'd still be you know um an expectation that they'd have an understanding of you know what constitutes a dcf I'll, I'll oh, put just, my education hat on. I was going to say, I'll go to, you know, to, 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 to the professor as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were teaching DCF in the 1980s and, uh, you know, alongside traditional techniques. And one one explains the other. This is this transparency argument. that, I've, You know, if you, if, if, if you just tell a student that it's, uh, the, you know, the value is, and this is how I was taught, because I actually went to, into practice first before sort of going into teaching and I was taught how to do a valuation and that was you put a YP on, on a rent and that's how you do a valuation and I'm afraid that is not understanding that is you know rote learning copying almost and you know to understand what the cap rate means and what uh, investment value value is you have to have some kind of view about your buy you know your PV you're buying you're buying the future at a, at a present value you've got to have some idea of what the cash flow how it's constructed and how it might pan out into the future um so essential i think also if you if you just going back to trad value if you just look at the difference between um a term and reversion approach and a hardcore top slice approach the only way you can explain that is through looking at the cash flow, um, the present value of each element of the cash flow, which is a DCF approach. So, as I think Neil says, it's, this is not new DCF. It is underlying everything we've done for the last 50 years. 
it's just we are now have been asking more questions about it. You probably need to know more about it. But it does, you've been doing them for years. The UK is incredibly lucky. It's got uh, lots of, in a sense, low rise, small, small properties. Um, you know, it was it uh, up until recently, it was not a high rise, large properties, sort of few assets, no, tra hardly any transactions. It was, you know, it, it was lots of transactional evidence. So it was very, it is very, very easy in most cases to do market value through a straight direct, almost direct comparison, but through, through an income and, and a cap rate. Um, but I think understanding cap rates requires DCF, and we should be understanding our valuations, not just knowing how to do them. Um, Mark has put a question to us, and it recognises that, that a discount rate is made up of assumptions in itself, but, but asks about um, what risk-free should be used in building up a discount rate, and just comment around uh, risk-free in general. I don't know who, who would like to take that uh, challenging please. question. Go on, Peter. <laughs> yes, please. This, this is the crux of the argument between market value and investment value. If you're working out the old investment value, which is the value to the individual, the company who owns the building, yes, you would probably start building up a risk free and adding premium, which is the way the old guidance note was very much leading it. Sorry, the old, it was an old guidance note. The new practice information paper is saying that for market value, you should be driven by analyzing deals. So you, you, re, you reverse the process. You actually analyze the deal which it was sold for and you derive a discount rate. You're not building it up from the bottom. You're taking it away from the top effectively. So you're going backwards in the analysis to analyze the deals you see in the market and you will come out with a discount rate. And that is your answer. In the same way, when we analyze a building on a track valve basis, you go backwards from the top. Um, you work out what the price is, you put it all in the system and you outcomes an equivalent yield and that is your comparable. So you're doing it the same way, but it is that is the key thing we're trying to get across in this paper, I think, is that market value, um, the market value side of DCF has never really been stressed as much as it is now. But forget the theory, in my view, forget the theory of building up risk free rates and onwards, or as much as you would for doing a trad vow. You really do have to think about coming backwards from doing your, your analysis to see what the market would pay, because it is that blended discount rate which we can derive from analysis. Um, how you want to go further than that and building your premium for different things, everything else, beta factors and risk-free rates is up to you. But at that stage, I don't think it's much relevant in the market value. You've got to start at your end value and analyze it backwards. But, but where you haven't got transactions, you might just have to revert back to first principles. And I think, and in a sense, if, if, if I answered that question rather than the one that Peter's answered, which I agree with, by the way, but um, I think you're talking about what, you know, what should the risk-free rate be? And to me, it's the, re it's the real, the real risk-free rate plus inflation expectations, if you want to break that one down a little bit. And, and I think that the, 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 discussion or the, the the issue that's been around for the last sort of 15 years um certainly in some jurisdictions and i'm thinking uk definitely uh, is the artificial level of interest rate uh, which have now finally reverted back to where they should be um i've, I've done a, quite a bit of work with the bank of england and they used to talk about a real return of two percent so I would start with a sort of a real return of 2% plus, plus expected inflation. But I think that they think that the investment, uh, well, I say, I, I've read some stuff from within the Bank of England that suggests they think that the required returns have actually dropped. So, you know, I, and I do think we should think about long-term returns rather than, the, almost the negative real returns that we've had because of the government action and they're not real that they're, they're they they to me are artificial so when we talked about discount rates during that period i preferred to look at the sort of the more long-term discount rate that should be there so so i would start from you need a real return for giving up your money you know real basic stuff here real return for giving up your money plus expected inflation that gives you the nominal risk-free rate and then you start to get into the really 
difficult stuff, which is risk premiums, because we need one of them as well. So if that Sorry, answers the question. I know we're short for time, but exactly that what Neil says here uh, in the region where data is even more scarce. Um, so it can be both both ways. Thank you so much. Uh, we are we have reached the top of the hour, but um, I, I did want to um, tempt fate and try the technology again, Sakeen, to ask the final poll uh, if people are staying on past the hour. So. Uh, and, and hopefully a similar 100% answer as well would be, uh, would be very nice. Uh, are you actively considering accommodating DCF more frequently in your work? Let's give the audience uh, 30 to 40 seconds to answer that question and, and see how that compares. Oh, are we seeing some votes coming in, Sakin? Yes, we are. It's working Fantastic. better this time. Oh, <laughs> so we give like it might a few be working better, but 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 yeah, uh, give us a worse result. Let's see. Yeah, all results right. are good. I'm going to close the poll in a few seconds. Thank you so much. All right. So, can you see the results, Charles, or not? I can. 65% say yeah. yes, 9% uh, no, 26% maybe. So uh, a positive response there around uh, the accommodating DCF and a similar result indeed to, to when we ran the poll in March. So interesting to see that people are looking about um, application um, moving forward. What I'd like to do uh, now is just uh, thank the panel uh, who've been brilliant today, but not only uh, great on our webinar today, but but throughout the um, the consultation period and as an expert working group as well, spending an inordinate amount of time pulling together all of the um, insight and research from the consultation into the practice information and hub that we see before you. So please do use the hub, please do use the practice information. It has specific chapters on market value and in, uh, investment value uh, as mentioned and those appendices which really support the link between income capitalization and, uh, and explicit DCF methods as mentioned as well. So there's some, there's some fantastic content out there. I'm sorry we haven't got to all of the questions in the chat, but we will make sure that they get a response uh, outside of the webinar uh, as well. Thank you all so much for joining us today uh, and I uh, hope you have a fantastic rest of the week. Cheers, everybody. Thank you.